Welcome back, I'm Tedward, and today, thanks to Bond Group in Waltham, Massachusetts, we're driving one of America's cutest and most dangerous little death traps. This is the 1989 Ford Bronco 2 and XLT trim. And back when this vehicle came out, people called the XLT the excellent little truck. This Ford Ranger based off-road do-it-all SUV really does check a lot of boxes. Its size makes it easy to park and its turning radius is actually fairly impressive. With its four-wheel drive, it can certainly get through snow and some pretty rugged off-road terrain if needed because you've got a two-speed transfer case to go into four low. And it's got room for four people. So even though they all came as two doors, you can always still put some people in the back or fold down those rear seats and use it as a station wagon. So now you've got a family car, you've got a thing hauler, and you can go off road except for the fact that it had a very low stability index meaning if you were to do the moose test if we need to swerve to get out of the way of something this was a major rollover risk and now we can go by the numbers to prove this because apparently in the 80s the rear wheel drive version of this car had a death rate of 3.78 deaths per 10,000 vehicles. That's mighty high. And somehow the NHTSA never actually went out and made Ford recall these vehicles. But we do know that there was obvious concerns in its development and choices by Ford not to fix them or mitigate the rollover risk of this vehicle because it would have cost too much money. But the fact that they didn't go ahead, turn around and change it, still cost them a ton of money in lawsuits because they had to settle billions of dollars. In fact, they were still settling lawsuits up to 2012 for rollover deaths in this Bronco 2. And just in case you were wondering how bad it is, one guy actually won a $1 million lawsuit in which he was paralyzed because he rolled his Bronco 2 while drunk. So even a drunk driver won a case against Ford. So now that we've got that out of the way, let's talk about what's underneath. So first, let's jump under the hood because this has a cool little engine. Oof. Under this very heavy hood, we have a 2.9 liter naturally aspirated fuel injected V6. Now the earlier cars came with a 2.8 liter carbureted V6. This one makes around 140 horsepower. I don't know how much of that is left, but actually this is in good shape. This is one of the cleanest little Ford Bronco 2s I think I've ever seen. Look at this. How can you not love that face? The old school Fords looked really good, and it's funny because it's like I'm looking at a tiny F-150 or a tiny Explorer. And the Explorer, of course, succeeded this, not without its own lawsuits when the Firestone tire thing happened. Inside, we've got these very classic Ford designs. We can lift this lever here, pop that forward, and that exposes the rear seats. Looking pretty darn good. And these are really easy to fold down. You just pop this and this, and boom. Now you've got all the storage space if you fold down both rear seats. And a little privacy curtain back here, a tonneau cover, and it drops down front and across, which allows you to cover up even if you have these down. This Bronco 2 is fitted with some all-terrain tires, and if you notice up front here, this is what you'd have to be turning manually in order to put this into four-wheel drive to lock these hubs to the axles. Now, this was designed to compete with the likes of the Jeep Cherokee and the Chevy S10 Blazer. So we've got our spare tire on our little swing here, and then a big old tailgate on struts, which are a little worn, but not so worn that I'm gonna get a head injury. That's always nice. And then back here, pretty darn good room. And if you fold those rear seats back, you're good to go. Now, like I said, you've got this cool little tonneau cover. So this comes out, very simple, nothing crazy. But what I like about this is then this little flap comes down, which makes sure that you're not gonna have anything exposed. You could actually keep some stuff in here, not to worry. Very clever stuff, Ford. We'll lock this guy into place. Let's start it up and take it for a ride. Got our key, ignition on the column. Very old school stuff. Remember the days when to put the radio on, you just go like this, backwards. Okay, we don't want a copyright strike, but we've got a little tape deck, and we, but we've got a clever little radio. And we've got knobs for everything, which is wonderful, very easy, and start it up. rear anti-lock lighting up. We've got 
disc brakes up front, drum brakes in the rear. Power windows, power locks, all the goodies. It's kind of wild though, when you look at this, it just looks so tacked on. Some of the 80s vibes of these trucks, man. We have some storage up front. And in here, with this little roller guy, oh yeah, we gotta be careful with this old plastic. We don't wanna be breaking stuff, but look at that. Coins for tolls. Down here, we can control our transfer case from too high, four high, neutral, and four low. We're just gonna drive it in two-wheel drive mode today for the sake of the road. We don't wanna mess up anything in the drive line by driving in four-wheel drive, nor do I need to spend all of that fuel, but to get it in a drive right here. And notice, oh yes, this is these are the days. There's two drives, right? Because it's a four-speed automatic. So you have one, two, drive, and overdrive. And remember my mother always starting out in drive and then shifting into overdrive when we got onto the highway. Now the size of this vehicle is one of its charms. It's really small, easy to maneuver in tight spaces, whether you're in the city or on a trail, but it also has an incredible turning radius. This is, this is pretty wild. Look at that. I don't know a whole lot of vehicles that could do that today, especially in four wheel drive. That's very cool. We can adjust the tilt but not telescope this wheel. We've got a little lever down here that allows us to do that. And listen to our blinker relay. Fairly smooth shifting transmission. I'm not even wide open throttle there. It seems abusive to do that. It's just interesting too, when you're looking at these old school gauges because by federal regulations, they changed it so they could only go up to 85 miles per hour on a speedometer. So in American cars, we, we, we had cars that were capable of going faster than 85 yet topped out on the speedo to disencourage, discourage speeding, which, you know, at the time, the national speed limit was 55 miles per hour. Unbelievably slow, honestly. This tachometer, though, you know, we're not revving up very high here. I think it redlines at 5,500 RPM, and it's certainly happier in that sort of, like, mid-range, which feels more like the high range of this engine, given its low redline. steering is light and airy and actually really comfortable. I think this is a joy to drive. I, I'm kind of falling in love with this little guy. It's very fun. really can't go sending this into corners because, well, history's taught us that's not a good idea. <laughs> I think I trust the, uh, the, the, the advice of old auto journalists and NHTSA recommendations in how to drive a vehicle like this. But what I don't want to do is just tarnish its reputation. I think it's just, it has to be spoken about when you talk about this vehicle because ignoring the lore would be irresponsible. But what this can do is serve today. Oh man, all right, still takes bumps a little rough. Um, what it can do today is be a really cool nostalgic off-roader for you because if you're not doing anything absolutely crazy, this is gonna be really capable. And if you just need a buzz around town car, go for it. You think like a, a, a topless series Defender is a safe vehicle? Of course not. Those are death traps too. So, you know, we can't just single it out as being like, well, this one. The problem, I think, in the story of this vehicle is just the fact that Ford knew. You know, Ford knew that this was probably going to be a little bit of a detriment to the public and that people weren't gonna know how to drive it. But with the knowledge we have now, you drive it calmly. 
you don't drive it in anger. It's certainly not overpowered, but it's also not underpowered. This is pretty adequate. And you know, it might even have just a little more poke than you'd expect for a car of this vintage. But it does seem to always wanna kinda of keep those revs up. So I would love to do a little fuel consumption test to find out what we're actually doing in order to maintain 35 or 40 miles per hour because it feels like I'm always in the pedal a little bit to keep it moving. Certainly not aerodynamic by any means. It's probably safe to assume there's a healthy amount of drivetrain loss. This example has 95,000 miles and it has been kept pristine. I am shocked. I, you know, we got to say it again. I'm shocked at how beautiful this truck is right now and how well maintained it is. I mean, this this should be rotted in the back of someone's property. Instead, I'm driving it like it's brand new and I feel so fortunate. So please don't assume that I'm like negative about the vehicle because of its past. I, I actually genuinely love this to the point where I've been considering maybe buying this for myself because I would have a blast driving around in this. But it is interesting when you, you look at that and then you start reading all the lawsuits and you're like, who do I think I am? <laughs> like, I don't know, maybe I would swerve to avoid a deer and meet my fate in the Bronco too. What a bizarre way to die in 2023. It's an incredibly comfortable cab and I really dig these seats. They're nice, it's cold outside, but because these are nice sort of like fabric, it, it, it warms up really quickly because it absorbs my body heat and kind of reflects it back at me. I could, you know, reach the other door. These could be roll windows and I'd be fine to open both, no problems. I have this great glass, huge glass on the side, so visibility, not an issue. It's more just about the unique driving style because it, 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 it is definitely tall. It is definitely a top heavy vehicle. There's a bit of roll. You get the idea that you do not want to add speed and violent motions to this because it's just not going to end well for you. But speaking of speed, let's get it out on a highway and see what it's like at highway speeds.
past the national speed limit in period. Here's 65. Is she stable? I'm not terrified, but I also don't know if I'm just being ignorant. Like, I do not get the sensation that I could make a very quick lane change right now, but I'm also not even going 65 miles per hour. I am fully aware <laughs> of the character of this vehicle. Gonna get passed by a Tacoma, which is essentially an ancient truck by today's standards, and yet I'm in this. So I can't knock that. We're gonna yield. I don't think I would wanna spend my life on the highway in the Bronco too. I think like 50 miles an hour is where this thing is at home and happy. Anything higher than that, you're probably asking for it. So for that, I think I would relegate this as a local towny vehicle or maybe like an island vehicle if you're on Martha's Vineyard or Nantucket or something like that where you've got the little vacation spot somewhere that doesn't require 60, 70 mile an hour speeds. Interesting, interesting. Okay, nobody in the driver's seat. I am, uh, I am curious, but not so curious that I want to make a friend. So I think that's going to do it for me in the Ford Bronco 2. Let me know what you think about vehicles like this in the comments below. The, the first generation Explorer, the Bronco 2, the Suzuki Samurai. There's a lot of vehicles out there like the Corvair and things that just have a reputation. The Pinto for either breaking away with lift off oversteer or blowing up upon impact or rolling over like this. Tire blowouts on the Explorer, things like that. Where does that capture your heart today in 2023? Because I can't look at it and just say, oh, it's just all political bollocks. That's silly. No, I mean, I mean, the numbers don't lie. People people lost their lives. I think there's upwards of maybe um, 800 people died from rollover accidents in these. Not just like, oh, they got in a crash and we counted the number. It's like somewhere between five and 800 people died in one of these just from rollovers. That's no joke. And it needs to be taken seriously. And it's very frustrating when a vehicle that's kind of designed to be a family vehicle is understood to be dangerous for like normal drivers, right? Most of us, especially if you're watching this video, you could probably get around just fine. Look, there's 95,000 miles on this one. Hasn't been rolled over yet. We're good to go. But the idea that it was understood in testing that ugh, this, this is going to be a problem for some people, for maybe a lot of people, for maybe enough people that it's going to look really bad on us and still put it out there without the redesign, without the refresh, without any kind of mitigation for the risk. That's very disheartening. But despite this being notoriously dangerous, I love it. And I don't know if that's something that's just wrong with me or if it's because the story and lore make it more full of character. It has some je ne sais quoi quality about it that I just, it's like, wow, this is what it was. How wild to drive it. So thank you guys so much for watching, liking, commenting, and subscribing. Thank you to Bond Group for tossing me the keys to probably the mintiest Bronco 2 on the East Coast, as far as I can tell. Don't forget to respect the drive, and I'll see you in the next one. It's soaking up most of the ugly stuff in these roads. I'm not really afraid to hit stuff. I thought I kind of thought this would be like more fragile. I you know, it's not a Toyota Hilux, but it definitely feels pretty darn stout.